All right. So for the last um, couple lecture segments, I wanted to, on the one hand, have a little bit of fun. We've worked hard on our fundamentals, and I think it's useful to see some applications, but also <clears throat> to get a little bit of perspective on what some questions are and some questions that, I mean, obviously, they're what I think are important. Some interesting problems that, are, that still exist in biophysics and biophysical chemistry. But I think one thing that's important is to understand the significance of water in biology. It's pretty obvious that we need water. At least as far as we know, we don't know of any life that doesn't have water. Um, even plants. Many plants can survive pretty well without sunlight. They can't do everything without sunlight, but they can survive. If you've ever, if you've ever seen white asparagus, then you know that these are nothing other than regular asparagus that have been grown with a tarp covering them. The tarp blocks the sunlight and keeps them from turning green, but they still live, right? And you can probably guess that those asparagus have to be watered, right? So water is super duper important. Obviously, they need carbon dioxide as well. To do photosynthesis, they need light, but they can do other things besides photosynthesis. So water is super important. Now, it may turn out it's not obligate, and there may be some other way that life can exist in a different solvent. Um, presumably, we expect it to be in some sort of solution phase where there's higher concentrations of reacting species. But it doesn't necessarily have to be in water. But our life, as far as we know, is in water, and so we're going to focus on that. And so that's what we're going to be doing uh, in this particular lecture segment. So one time I had a chance to teach a class on water. The whole class focused on the chemistry of water and looked at a lot of the aspects of water that I'll talk about in this segment right now. All right, so water is super important. Um, first of all, uh, it has even inspired the poets. So here in the authors, this is D.H. Lawrence, who wrote, water is H2O, hydrogen two parts, oxygen one. But there is a third thing that makes it water, and nobody knows what it is. So I don't know exactly what he's talking about, the, what he thinks the third thing would be. But I think one of the themes is that water is, you know, part of culture. It's part of almost every culture, every religion has a significance for water. Um, and then, of course, it has a scientific importance. Um, it's a weird thing, right? It's a simple molecule. It's actually quite abundant in the universe. Um, it's a, almost one of the simplest molecules you can imagine having that has abundant elements in it. But because of the peculiar properties, its dipole moment and hydrogen bonding, water the liquid is quite unusual. And that is one of the reasons why people think it's so important. All right, so first of all, we know water is everywhere. Certainly on our planet, it's all over the place. Most of the planet is covered by water in the liquid form. And, you know, liquid is kind of special. There's not that many places. The, the temperature range over which you have liquid is only 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, if you change the pressure, you don't have as much water. Um, so we don't know about literal liquid water on other uh, planets. We, we suspect that there was liquid water on other places, but we don't see it now, obviously, except here. Uh, we live in the Great Lakes region, so water is obviously super important to us. Then there's places like Africa, where they have the giant waterfalls. We'll talk about the hydrophobic effect next. All right, so you can see all these amazing things. Here's a an ant that has the ability to harvest a water drop, drink from it. The very spherical shape is because of the extreme hydrophobicity of the surface that it's on. All right, so we, we have lots of visions in our mind we think of when we think of water. Many times these are positive visions, right? But of course, there's not always that. Um, before I get to that, let's think of uh, there's water all over the place. This is Orion the constellation, and in the middle of it, there's this little red, reddish-looking thing here, which is a nebula. And in that nebula, uh, it's a water factory. It's creating six times the Earth's water every day. 
So water's all over the place. It's in the it's in our atmosphere, but it's also in the universe. Water is a very common molecule. Liquid water is rare, as far as we know. All right. So it is everywhere, but it's also everywhere, right? And so it causes problems. We know very well living in Michigan, what happens when you neglect your water supply. It causes floods. Right? It causes land slides, mudslides. It holds lots of toxins and disease. It can be quite devastating water. And it isn't everywhere. There are many places in the world where it's very hard to find water. Many of you have aspirations of becoming doctors and other health professionals. And one of the biggest challenges that developing world medicine faces is having clean water. It's not having MRI machines or CAT scans. It's just having clean water. And what we do, of course, in human, human manipulation of water is that we make dams to, for irrigation to supply water to places like Las Vegas. And when we do that, we, have, we make a mark on the world. For example, we can deplete the water resources by diverting them. So this is going to be and continues to be one of the big societal challenges. A lot of times it's in the background and we don't notice it. So at least one billion people lack access to clean, safe drinking water. It's a lot of people. Right? And then, of course, who does it affect most? It affects the most poor. Right? And then another 1.8 billion people. So now you add that up. Right? That's 2.9 billion people. They don't have water immediately available. They have to travel, but less than a kilometer. That doesn't sound so bad, maybe, but you know, a kilometer carrying tons of water, uh, it's a lot of work right? that you could be doing, being creative, solving problems, but they have to just drink water. Right? So this is the reality for many, many people in the world. And even in our community, right, not so long ago, people were having to carry water. Not because we didn't have it. Michigan, all we have is water, right? We're surrounded by it. But unfortunately, when the lead is in the water, it causes problems. We know how to get rid of lead from water. It's not a science problem. Science is 100% understood. Okay, so we use water in many cases. Here's an example. We use it in agriculture, sometimes wastefully, sometimes cleverly, to grow things in places where it's hard to do it with modern technology and ancient technology. There's consequences for this water use. Here's the bottom left shows Lake Erie with the algal blooms. Huge amounts of pollution caused by the vast amount of fertilizer used in the fields nearby the lake. The runoff water goes into the lake and fertilizes all of the, uh, act back the algal bacteria in the water. And when you over-farm and don't do it right, you end up getting rid of all the topsoil. And that's what the dust bowl was. Right? So it's hard to know how to do everything right. We use water in industry, too. You might not know this, but the purest water in the world is made by Intel. They have these factories for making super ultra mega pure water, which is used to clean the silicon chips that are in your computer and your phone. It's used for cooling, probably one of the big uses, right? Power plants. It shows you where water is being used, or being withdrawn is the word they use. And you can see a lot of that. Of course, it's mostly centered where people are. That's not too surprising, though much less in the southwest. All right, so this is showing some other examples in Louisiana, for example, where they're using lots of water. You might wonder why they're using so much water. One of the uses for water is for hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, which was a recent development in new ways of doing oil and gas exploration. Um, before we did that, 
the price of gas and oil were going way up. And then after hydraulic fracturing was dis basically discovered and implemented, um, the U.S. became one of the biggest producers of natural gas and oil in the world, which had some geopolitical consequences. It certainly altered our dependence on other oil-producing countries and natural gas-producing countries. Um, but also, it meant that we used a lot of resources to drill the wells. And if we look at this, this shows the domestic crude oil production by a source. Right? And you can actually see in 2011 a huge increase in so-called tight oil, oil that's hard to get out. Now you might ask, what's the point of the water? Well, it is called hydraulic fracturing, so you probably can guess that some water has something to do with it. It has to do with drilling holes. And the way that they do it is they drill holes by pumping water, extremely high pressure, tons and tons of water, into the ground, and then they can actually go down and change direction. And then they can go to directly to the direction of where the, the oil is that they're trying to get. That's huge. Being able to drill horizontally was actually the big breakthrough. Well, it takes massive quantities of water. And then what they do is, inside the water, they want to deposit sand. That's what they're actually trying to do, break the ground. But if you break the ground, it's elastic. It'll come back. So what you do is you need to be able to break the ground, put something in it to prop it open so it doesn't, the holes don't collapse. And so they, they put in sand. Uh, but water and sand, as you know, they don't really mix, right? So you need to add something that is an emulsifier, which traps the sand kinetically in the water keeping it in the water so that it will develop, deliver the sand. Well, then they added all kinds of, of long-chain oligosaccharides. One of them is called guar gum. If you ever read the ingredients on some ice cream, for example, you'll see guar gum as one of the ingredients. It's simply a long saccharide like PEG that can uh, make the water more viscous, and then the sand can get trapped in the water. And then when it gets drilled in, the sand stays, the water comes back out. But the water is super salty and very toxic when it comes out. So you see these, the, the cars, the trucks, sorry, are carrying all the water into and out of the well. So this shows an example of the natural gas prices um, as a function of time and the dramatic impact that hydraulic fracturing had on changing that. Now, actually, it's interesting. Even though you do a lot of water, you use a lot of water, to do fracking, um, it turns out that you have to think like a thermodynamics scientist, right? The whole amount of water that you might want to consider. So although it takes a lot of water to drill a well, because people were changing their power generation from, uh, from coal to natural gas, it turns out that the efficiency of making electricity from natural gas is way higher. What does that mean? We learned this, right? You're doing an engine, you're doing something, What's the heat difference, the temperature difference? Well, for coal, it's less efficient. There's a bigger temperature difference for the same amount of energy output. So it turns out it takes a lot less water to cool a natural gas-powered coal of a power plant than it does to cool a coal power plant. We always just think about it from the point of view of the coal. But when you think about it from the point of view of the water, it says here that you can, for every gallon used for hydraulic fracture, fracturing uh, drilling, Texas was saving 33 gallons of water. Right, so that's actually an interesting thing to think about the whole thing. Now, of course, there's also earthquakes associated with the fracking. So it's not like it's all simple. There are pluses and minuses to all kinds of our human creativity. The water is weird, right? Here's an amazing picture. I don't know if it's real, but let's pretend it is because it's beautiful. Right? So this is an, an iceberg. <laughs> And there are many, many famous quotes about icebergs. You can tell by the fact that it's floating, that it's at least somewhat less dense than the water that's around it. Not tons, because it's not floating on top like a cork. It's mostly underwater, but nevertheless, some of it is on top. Right? So ice floats, which means it's less dense. And we know why that is. The reason why that is is because water is hydrogen bonded. And although you might think hydrogen bonds keep things together, they actually keep things a little bit apart because in water, liquid water, the average number of hydrogen bonds for a water molecule, including both the, the donating and the accepting hydrogen bonds, 
The maximum is about 4, which is what you'd expect for a tetrahedral ice structure. It's about 3.6 for water in the liquid. That means there's a few missing hydrogen bonds per molecule, like on average. Not a few, less than one, but nevertheless, every, let's say, several water molecules will have a missing hydrogen bond. Um, that, what that does, it actually allows the water molecules to get a little closer together. Otherwise, they're being pulled apart in all the different directions. Think about all your influences that you have in your life, pulling you in one way, pulling you another way. All right, same idea. You break some of those, and you can compress. Most of the weird properties of water uh, relate to hydrogen bonding, as you might expect. And so here we can look at a number of different parameters. This is showing the boiling points and the melting points um, that you probably understand. Critical points you might not. Um, it's a topic that we didn't discuss in this class. You've probably heard it in other classes. It's just the point where there's a, not a differentiation between a, a liquid and a, and a gas. Um, but nevertheless, you can see these are water is anomalous for all of them. If you look at dihydrogen, calcogenides like so, sulfur, selenium, tellurium. Right? And so then you can see they're chemically very similar, but there's a huge difference between the melting point of H2O and H2S, even though chemically they're very similar, the bonding is similar. Sulfur is even polarizable. Um, then you look at the boiling points. Water can be viewed as a sort of a kind of like an alcoholish type thing, and it's been that it has OHs on it anyway. Um, but the, wa the boiling point of um, water is much different from methanol or any of the other alcohols. Right? Now, methanol and the other alcohols certainly do hydrogen bonding, but they don't do it to the extent that water does. <clears throat> right? And you look at boiling point. Um, so that was that's the bottom left is showing boiling points and melting points with the alcohols and hydroxyl containing molecules. On the right, you have things that are sort of comparing the, the boiling points of different uh, hydrides. All right. Well, one of the most important aspects in our development of understanding water at all comes from computer simulation. Um, and you can look at this particular one. This is the vaporization of the water surface. We can actually start to see molecular details of these processes that we usually just discuss kind of schematically with cartoons. One thing that this is showing you is that when the water molecules can, um, you know, are near a surface and there's a good concentration of water molecules, then you'll even see dimers in the vapor. Now, that dimer is not going to last forever. Probably already mostly disappeared. No, it's still together. Um, right, but it's showing you how you can imagine thinking about the vapor-air interface, the water-air interface, water-vapor interface. Right, lots of simulations and experiments are done to uh, try to understand the nature of the water molecules at this interface. That's very important for huge numbers of things that you'll see in chemistry. All right, water is weird, right? So here's another summary slide showing that, where you have critical points, boiling points, freezing points on some analogous molecules, methane, ammonia, water, hydrofluoride, HF, um, and neon, which of course is not a molecule, but it sticks together nevertheless. And water's got the most of all of those, right? Because the interactions between water molecules are strong. And the reason why they're strong is because of the hydrogen bond. And one simple, simple way to think of a hydrogen bond between water is just think of two water molecules as a dimer. On the right side, you see one of the molecular orbitals of water nearby the HOMO. It's a HOMO minus two, it looks like. And what it's showing you is that there's electronic delocalization between the two water molecules. Right, that if I was to um, separate the water molecules, which I'm doing this calculation by simply moving them apart from each other, I can see how the electron density gets donated from one water molecule to the other. Right, so what you understand then, obviously in a liquid things will be a little bit different. This is not a liquid, it's just two molecules. But you get the idea that maybe hydrogen bonding is not simply an electrostatic charge or dipole-dipole interaction, that there's actually some charge transfer, some, some sort of chemical effect. We'll talk about this in a minute, but the water vapor layer uh, below a hot plate is, um, is going to have a very strong analogy to hydrophobicity. Let me show you that right now. So it turns out there's this stuff called ultra-ever-dry. I actually don't have it. I should probably get some. 
Um, it's a commercial product that you can coat. It's a su super hydrophobic coating. All right, and what this cartoon is showing you there is that there's a piece of glass, right, which has been coated on the outside with a frame, like they're calling it a frame, like for a picture, the black area, with this ultra ever dry stuff. It's very hydrophobic. We'll talk about hydrophobicity in its, on its own in, in a separate lecture segment. All right, and then in the middle, there's nothing there. There's just glass, right? What you're going to see is water, of course, is going to get trapped into that middle region because the black area is hydrophobic. On the right-hand side, though, is a different, bit, a different scenario. It'll be a hot plate, All right, which you can simulate yourself using a stove or something, like a pan. And on the hot plate, it's just going to be really hot, and then there's going to be some water on there. And we know what happens when you have hot water on a hot plate. Water on a hot plate, it doesn't inst if the if the hot plate's hot enough, the water will not instantly boil. What'll happen is there'll be a little vapor layer from the the water vapor that's created by the super hot hot plate, but it's going to be sort of cooled by the water on top, and so you end up trapping the water vapor between the two. But because water vapor has a pretty poor thermal conductivity, it essentially thermally insulates the water droplet from the hot plate. Okay, and it makes this sort of cushion of a water vapor. This is sometimes called film boiling or laden frost. So we're going to look now at the left. This is a video from this ultra ever dry company. Uh, they drop a drop. They put it on their hydrophobic surface. Look at that ball. And then it gets kind of absorbed or, you know, whatever, sucked into the other one. And he's now pushing or they're pushing on the thing now and showing you kind of the jiggling water that you can see. Now water is they're not doing anything except putting a hydrophobic ring around the thing, but the water is being trapped in the inside, which is really cool. All right, let's look at the, the right-hand side movie now. So what we have on the right-hand side is something that actually looks very similar, right, doesn't it? You have a water droplet or a water bubble, whatever you want to call it. It's moving around. Look, they even did the same thing. They, they dropped some water on there, and it gets sucked up by the, the collective blob. And it makes cool modes and stuff that, that you don't get in another one because of the shape, but whatever, that's not the point. The point is that they look very similar, okay? And the reason they look very similar is because we now understand pretty well that in fact when you have a hydrophobic surface, especially a flat one, it's characterized by a reduced density of water at the interface, something that's called a drying transition. And that drying transition is characteristic of hydrophobic interfaces. And that's very important because that's going to affect the, the nature of the water in the vicinity of a hydrophobic solute, for example, in chemistry, which as you learn a biochemistry class, you can anticipate what that's going to be. That's basically going to be a protein. Because although proteins are semi-hydrophilic mostly, compared to water, they're still reasonably hydrophobic. Some characteristics of water that are important. Uh, for example, here you can look at the distance between the oxygen and hydrogen. So this is the OH bond distance within one molecule as a function of the temperature. So as you increase the temperature, what happens to that bond length? It actually goes down. And you might ask, why does the bond length go down when you increase the temperature? That seems very counterintuitive. The reason is because you start breaking hydrogen bonds. Like, look at the green line on top. The green line on top says, Right, you break a hydrogen bond, the average distance between the oxygen and the, the two oxygens gets bigger. There's less hydrogen bonding, there's less maybe of that charge leaking out like we saw before. And so that can tighten up the OH bond. We also know, it's not shown here, that the vibrational frequency of the OH stretch will shift as you increase the temperature for the same reason. The, the, molecule will, the water molecule always has some broken hydrogen bonds. And that population of broken hydrogen bonds grows as you break hydrogen bonds, and the infrared spectrum of water appears to shift to the blue, to higher energy, as you increase the temperature because you're favoring the population of broken hydrogen bonds. Uh, there's some other stuff there. So, look, okay, looking at pressure. So, as you increase the pressure, you stuff the water molecules closer together, you enhance hydrogen bonding, and so the picture is exactly backwards. Very intuitive, though. All right, and so this, these two effects are responsible for many of the anomalous properties of water. Uh, this is showing on the right-hand side uh, the heat capacity. All right, so they're showing the heat capacity of ice. And ice is what you normally expect to see at 220 Kelvin. Right, that's cold. 
273 is zero, right, Celsius, right? So 230 is pretty low. It turns out you can cool the water uh, without it freezing. Maybe you've done this unwittingly yourself. If you have a, a bottle or something in the back porch of your cold Michigan house, um, it may not freeze because freezing is an activated process. You need to start freezing by nucleating the growth of a crystal. If you have a super clean bottle, like a water bottle or a soda bottle or a beer bottle, whatever, there's not much in there to nucleate the growth. And so those bottles, the liquid inside the bottle can stay cold way below the freezing point. When you open it, it instantly freezes. So it's a pretty easy experiment to do. Take a water bottle, a plastic one, put it in your freezer very gently, wait a day or two, and then maybe you should put three, or f three water bottles in there. It doesn't always work. And then when you take them out, probably one of them will not be frozen. But if you tap it on the table, that'll cause a disturbance. Just like when you scratch your beaker when you're crystallizing a molecule in a chemistry lab. And then the, the water will freeze more or less instantaneously, or at least really quickly. Right? And that's because you've made supercooled water. So supercooled water has an unusual heat capacity, which is to say that around 230 degrees, it actually, the heat capacity gets really big. Now, we'll talk about that when we talk about protein folding, but that indicates there's a phase transition there. So it turns out that that phase transition in water is still hotly debated by very smart and very opinionated people. Um, and it's, a, it's fun to not be doing that science, <laughs> but to know enough about it to appreciate why it's interesting. All right, there's some other enthalpy of vaporization. We already did that. It's a boiling point. Um, some other things about the diffusivity which I'm just going to skip, but basically it effect, it's affected by density and pressure in a way that seems un unintuitive, but it's not unintuitive when you realize that what you're doing is manipulating the hydrogen bonding. All right, so water is hot. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is in the not too distant future, you know, meaning within the last 15 years or so, many, many papers have been published in the absolute top journals in science, in this case, literally science, about things you would have thought would have been sorted out years ago. All right. Here is a handful of papers published by people in my community who do ultra-fast infrared spectroscopy to understand the dynamics of water. Um, and there's even more. This is, this, this slide, these slides were made about two years ago, and I just didn't update it. But there's always something new on water that you can learn when you use even more advanced techniques that have structural dynamics measurement capabilities, such as ultra-fast infrared spectroscopy. There are some others about talking about coordination shell structure, the so-called memory loss has to do with frequency fluctuations, um, the coupling between the different vibrational modes and how that affects the dynamics of water and energy transfer. A lot of this is related to sort of how does heat flow. All right, and then now you see in 2011, a lot of work on the surface. What is water like at the interface of water, vapor, and the water, the liquid? Now we can do spectroscopy so that only looks at the monolayer, roughly, of molecules at the interface with air. And that's a very hot field. People argue a lot, though. <laughs> so if you have a thin skin, the water is not for you. <laughs> this, is a, this is a feisty field. I'm not a big fan of that, but that's sort of the way it is. And so people have very strong opinions about hydrogen bond. Here's network of hydrogen bond rearrangements. Structure in the first coordination shell of liquid water measured with x-ray. Here's people commenting on each other. So this is a technical comment, which is kind of like a a diss in a science world. When you comment on something, it usually means you think they're wrong and you want to uh, point out how, just how wrong they are, not just leave it, just leave it to the reader. So there's some arguments here. You can find both the data and, and, and analysis contradict a well-known model or whatever. Okay. So now let's get ourselves oriented a little bit into the biochemistry context. I mean, water is, is super important to understand by itself, but there is basically no pure water in the world, <laughs> or anywhere else for that matter. Water has always got some schmutz in it, right? And that's why Intel has to spend all this money 
making their big fancy water purifying gadget in, I think it's in Burlington, Vermont. So when they're not doing that, I guess they go skiing or listen to fish or twiddle or whatever else they have over there. So um, this is myoglobin. No, it's not. It's something else. I forgot what protein this is. <laughs> it's probably, maybe it's lysozyme. Um, anyway, it's a protein, and so you are familiar with what this means. This is a schematic representation of a structure showing the alpha helical regions, some things that look like beta sheets. So you see the arrows pointing in opposite directions. Those are anti-parallel beta sheets. And then some sort of random coil or not, not well-defined secondary structure element, the little loopy region on the right there. Right, but of course it's a molecule, and what that means is there's bonds and atoms all over the place. It's not a cartoon. Um, so always remember that when you look at those abstract structures that there's actually atoms in there. Um, and now that came from a crystallography experiment. And what you can do with any protein data bank file, if you use a program called PyMol, is that you can put back the crystal together. You can put the crystal back together again. And when you put the crystal back together again, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to see all of the water molecules that are very um, sort of stuck or well-defined in their orientation with respect to the protein. Those are the so-called crystallographic water molecules. And what you'll notice is that the, there are a lot of water molecules. That's what the red dots are. They're actually oxygens in a crystal structure. You can't really see the hydrogens in a biological X-ray crystal. Um, but nevertheless, this is what some people refer to as a hydrated protein. Now, of course, there's a lot more water than this around a protein in a biological context. And there's not a whole lot of space between those proteins when you actually put a space filling representation on there. So when you look at data that comes from X-ray crystallography, you have to be aware of the fact that although there are water molecules, um, they're nothing like the water molecules you will have in solution. And so there's likely to be some effects on the structure by this packing interaction between the different proteins. Right, so that's what the point of that is to show you. This is an interesting um, example of the thing I was talking about before, the water dancing on either the superhydrophobic surface or on the ultra-hot or very hot plate. This is an example of water at a metal interface. And you can imagine in electrochemistry, where you might do electrolysis or some kind of electrocatalytic reaction at a metal interface where the metal is the electrode, for example. The water is going to interact with the metal to some degree. And this is showing you a simulation of water molecules at a metal interface. And what you'll notice is that there's very few water molecules nearby the metal. It's just running. I don't know exactly what the, the details of this. But that surface that you see there is the sort of the surface of the of the, where you have most of the water molecules. And you see, hopefully, a, what is a de-wetting of the surface, meaning that there's a, a gap where there's not a lot of water molecules near the metal. And that's a characteristic of this hydrophobic surface. Here's another example. This one's really cool because it's the molecular version of that um, super hydrophobic plate I was talking about I showed you before. This is now um, graphite. Now, graphite is a, is a wonderful um, model system that has, it's very hydrophobic, and because of that, people like to use it to simulate hydrophobic interfaces. And here what they do is they've done the same thing, where they've controlled the interaction between the water and the graphite, and what you'll see now is if you do a simulation, you see the effects that I was, have been highlighting before, which is that there's kind of a a, a bit of a, what looks like maybe a bit of a gap, although I don't think you see it very clearly on this particular representation, but you see the drop form. So even at the molecular level, the surface tension that we talked about, you know, earlier in the semester uh, happens and you get this, this drop. And it turns out you can, by measuring the tangent line to the drop near at the interface, that you end up with a, a tilt. And that tilt angle tells you is a characterization of the um, hydrophobicity. So something that's very not very hydrophilic will have a flat water film covering it completely, so that tangent slope will be basically zero. And something that has like that water drop that the ant was sucking from is almost a perfect sphere, so it'll have a, a tangent going in the exact opposite direction. So those are things you can measure relatively straightforwardly just by looking at droplets of water. And measuring that contact angle, you can figure out how hydro you can characterize the hydrophobicity of a surface, at least 
the average hydrophobicity. Now, of course, water is important in biology, not just for um, being there as a solvent and, you know, helping the macromolecular machines find their, make their, their structures and also just being there to uh, dissolve stuff like salts and whatever else you want to dissolve. It also goes in and out. So here's an example on the left of a protein called aquaporin. So aquaporin is a, a protein that is super important for allowing water to get in and out of cells. Um, people knew from measuring water diffusivity through membranes long before any structural data was known that there had to be protein, there had to be pores, there had to be channels that allowed water through. Um, and Peter Ager, who won the Nobel Prize, but I don't remember exactly what year, I'll put it in when I edit this. Peter Ager, who won the Nobel Prize, um, characterized the structures of these. And now we know that there's these little uh, key amino acids that can kind of selectively let the water through at the expense of things like other ions or small molecules that would be similar. Um, the left, obviously, is a molecular dynamic simulation that I got from the Klaus Schulten's website at the University of Illinois. On the right is, is actually a really old simulation at this point, over 10 years, but it's still mesmerizing. And it's showing you how we can, we, how the group, the group from the Max Planck Institute about 10 years ago used a huge computer simulation to, um, this doesn't loop, um, to look at the whole membrane. So you have a membrane, you have lipids, you have the um, aquaporin proteins, and you can actually simulate the whole thing, the whole soup, you know, with water and the protein and lipids, and you can actually study the water molecules going through. Um, so this is remarkable. This is an all, that is an all-atom simulation of a membrane that at that time was a breakthrough. Nowadays, it's much more, much more common. Okay, so water channels are not just for passive um, transport of water. Now, of course, what makes a water, why would, would make the water go from one side to the other would be some concentration imbalance, like maybe there was too many positive charges, too many sodium ions on one side and not enough on the other, so that would cause, because of the chemical potential difference, it would cause the water to move until the chemical potential became equal, and that would be the equil equilibration. Um, one thing that people like to do is to take real biological water wires or biological water channels. There's two examples here. The bottom left is showing you um, a protein called bacterial rhodopsin, which is a proton pump that is in bacteria that is actually responsible for pro pumping protons across a membrane, and that's actually the main, they're the only source of energy transduction for these purple bacteria. Um, on the upper right is something that you have. This is cytochrome C oxidase, which is probably you can tell by all those alpha helices. Those are going to be sitting inside a membrane. Both of these are membrane proteins. And on the right, you see, so that you'll see there, there's actually two heme groups that are kind of like tilted next to each other. And then there's a bunch of water molecules that are inside. And Cytochrome C oxidase does something similar. Instead of being driven by light, which is bacteriodopsin's job as a, a molecule similar to the retinol that's in your eye, in your, in your rhodopsin in your eye, that isomerizes. And isomerization provides an energy jolt that allows the protons to get translocated through the protein. In the case of cytochrome C oxidase, that little green dot on top, the green sphere on the top, is um, coming from cytochrome C, which can be which can deliver an electron to the cytochrome C oxidase. And then that electron is transferred, coupled with proton transfer, and you have this proton-coupled electron transfer in the um, oxidative metabolism that you probably learned about in some bio biochemistry or bio biological biology class. Um, and then what happens, of course, is that there has to be a way for the protons to go through, and they go through a water wire, just like they do in the bacteriodopsin case. So water wires are a fancy word for a sort of a single file of water molecules where a proton can shuttle from one to the other. It's not necessarily the exact proton that started on one side that gets the other, but it goes through like a bucket brigade, and at the end a, pop, a proton pops out. They're indistinguishable, so you can't tell anyway. All right, and that proton transfer can be quite fast, um, and then you make a proton gradient, which then fuels or gives free energy necessary to, um, cause, to create ATP from ADP, which as we know, 
That's endergonic. So the exergonic thing that the, you need to do work, you need to get some delta G from somewhere else that's negative, and that comes from the driving force, comes from the proton gradient. Um, on the left is a abstraction of all of this. So instead of always studying proteins, which can be hard, one thing that people like to do is they like to say, okay, what's a model that would be sort of the simplest possible way of thinking about this? And so they'll take something like a carbon nanotube, which is the, the sort of chicken wire framework that you see. And then it's just big enough, depending on the size of the carbon nanotube. That's why it says CNT, by the way, on the bottom left, uh, to fit like one single file water wire in there. And then if you notice W4 on the left uh, has three hydrogens attached to it. Right? So that's the proton the protonated water, and then that water is going to pass from one to the other, you know, maybe to the imidazole, for example, on the other side. And so that's a way that people use computer simulations of very controlled and simple systems to understand about how, what are the nat what's the nature of proton translocation when you change, for example, the electrostatic environment where you see there, they have a plus Q and a minus Q, they just added some charges that would mimic having some maybe arginine or some, you know, whatever, some charge residue in the protein in the middle. All right, so this is still, I would say, an extremely active area of research to understand how water wires work. Uh, it's very complex because you have the coupled dynamics of the water and the protein. You also have the fact that the protons themselves are really quite quantum mechanical, and so they can't be ignored. They can't be only treated as if they're uh, classical particles. Okay, so that's a sort of brief overview, I guess it's not brief enough, but a brief overview of um, some, con some things to think about when, you, when you're considering water. Um, as we know, most biological structures form by the hydrophobic effect, and so that'll be something that I talk about next. The hydrophobic effect is interesting, um, especially the name. It implies that something is hiding from the water, and what I hope to convey to you here you've seen the importance of hydrogen bonding and how hydrogen bonding causes these so-called anomalous properties of water. Now, I should say, many molecules have anomalous properties. It's just that there are very few that have all of them. <laughs> so you can find a weird one for melting point or a weird one for, you know, the thermal conductivity or a weird one, weird one for heat capacity, but th to have one that has them all is extraordinarily unusual, right? And that is something that um, drives a lot of people's interest in water. Um, Mostly, it's going to come down to the hydrogen bonding, right? So really, we call it the hydrophobic effect, but it should be called the, in some sense, the protein phobic effect from the viewpoint of the water. The water really doesn't want to break that hydrogen bond. It's, it's weak enough that you can break them thermally, right? We'll, we'll tell, remind ourselves of what the energy scales of hydrogen bonds are. They're about a tenth of a kilo, uh, covalent bond. Um, but they're strong enough that they really do dictate uh, the properties of water. Um, and other things can do hydrogen bonding as well. So it's not just water. It's just that almost nothing can do hydrogen bonding as well with water. And even if you have a very strong interaction somewhere, you might distort the hydrogen bonding network such that it frays or it gets kind of screwed up somewhere else. So the net balance is going to be uh, deleterious from the point of view of the Gibbs energy, whether it's enthalpy or entropy. And what we're going to see also, something very important here, is we often think of entropy and enthalpy as being distinct, right? They're two different symbols, for sure, but they really aren't distinct, okay? And what we're going to see with the hydrogen bond is that they are two sides of the same coin, right? That the number of microstates available to you is dictated by the fact that you need to preserve the enthalpic interactions. And that is something that is very important, and if that's like the only thing you remember from this course, I'll be fine with that because it's a very important point, um, and I'll, do it, I'll go through that again slower uh, with the hydrophobic effect next.